ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد all thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom we thank seek for help and invoke for forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within ourselves he whom Allah guides will never be misled and he whom Allah leads astray will never find one to guide him and we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his slave and messenger. In the hadith collection of Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah, there is an amazing hadith narrated by the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jabir ibn Abdullah. So Jabir radiallahu an, he narrates that once we proceeded in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the battle of Dhat al-Riqa'. Now the battle of Dhat al-Riqa'. It was a battle that occurred in the fourth year after the migration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from Mecca to Medina, and it was a battle between the Muslims and a few of the Arab tribes, the non-Muslim Arab tribes of that time. So during the battle, one of the companions he happened to kill the wife of one of the non-believers. So when the battle was over and all the dust settled, this non-believer saw that his wife had been killed. So this enraged him. He was extremely angry. He was drunk with rage and vengeance. He wanted to take his revenge. So he took an oath. He made a vow to himself that he said that I will not stop until I kill one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So obviously when the battle ended, the Muslim army was returning to Medina. And on its way back, the Prophet ﷺ, he set up camp in a certain place. And it was night time, so he asked his companions, who's going to keep watch over us tonight? Who's going to handle the security detail for tonight? So two companions, they volunteered themselves. One from the Muhajirun and one from the Ansar. So he told them that go stand at the mouth of the mountain pass and stand guard there all night. So when these two companions, this Muhajir and this Ansar, when they got to the mouth of the mountain pass, they decided to take turns keeping guard. They said one of us will sleep half the night while the other guards the other half. So it so happened that it was the Ansari's turn first to guard. So while he was guarding, the Muhajir went and laid down and went to sleep. And this whole time, of course, this non-believer, the person who took this vow of vengeance, he was watching the whole time. So now when this Ansari was standing by himself, he decided that, you know what, instead of just standing here idly and just looking out, I might as well pray as well. So he started praying, right? He got up to pray. So now this enemy, he saw that this was the perfect time to take my revenge. The whole Muslim army is asleep. No one's watching. This man is standing by himself alone. I can kill him extremely easily. So he, he, he snuck up behind him and he took out an arrow from his quiver. And he loaded his arrow, his bow up and he pulled back and let it fly. Right? So he actually hit this companion while he was praying with an arrow. And what did this companion do? Right? He didn't yell in pain. He didn't flinch. He just simply took the arrow and threw it to the side. And the narration mentions that this non-believer, this enemy of Islam, he hit him again with an arrow. And then again, and then again. So he shot him four times with an arrow. And after the fourth time, he finally made sajda, completed his salah, and he went to his companion who was lying down. So he woke him up, and the companion was shocked. He's like, Ya Subhanallah, why didn't you wake me up when you were hit with that first arrow? You know what his answer was? He said, I was reading a surah of the Qur'an, and I did not want, wish to interrupt it. I was reading a surah of the Qur'an, and I did not wish to interrupt that recitation. And it comes in another narration, that the surah he was reciting was Surah Al-Kahf. Now, let's just take a step back a moment, and look at this story. This isn't just simply a bedtime story. It's not some type of fairy tale. This is an actual event that occurred. This is something that really happened. So how is it that a person can continue praying after being shot with an arrow? Not once, not twice, not even thrice, but four times, right? How is it that the pain of being hit by four arrows, the pain of being injured, 
the sight of all that blood didn't cause him to break his salah. What is it that he found in his prayer? What is it that he found in his recitation that prevented him from breaking his prayer? Right? What special thing did he find in his salah and his recitation that we don't find in our prayers? Right? He was able to continue praying after being shot by four arrows and a lot of us today can't even concentrate in salah for five minutes. So what is, it that, what is that special thing that he had? So they say that the special thing that he had was he had tasted the sweetness of iman. He had tasted halawatul iman. That the enjoyment and the, and, the, and, the, and the good feeling he was getting from his prayer and his recitation far outweighed the pain of those four arrows. Right? He had tasted this thing which is known as halawatul iman. And the sweetness of, of sweetness of iman, it is that thing that makes us enjoy doing acts of worship. Right? We actually enjoy praying. We enjoy fasting. We enjoy reciting Qur'an. We enjoy coming to the masjid. We enjoy making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that thing that causes us to undergo hardships and difficulties to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? To fulfill our obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a matter of fact, when a person tastes the sweetness of iman, when he tastes the halawatul iman, then these hardships and difficulties, they become easy for him. Right? You can even say they become pleasurable for him. He starts to enjoy these difficulties. He starts to enjoy these hardships and they become extremely pleasurable for him. More pleasurable than the pleasures of this world. Right? So this is what this companion had. He had tasted the sweetness and he couldn't get enough. That's why those pain, that pain of being hit by four arrows was not enough for him to stop his recitation and break his salah. So there's many examples of the sweetness of Iman that we can also taste in our daily lives. Right? For example, waking up for Fajr in the morning, especially nowadays, it's early and it's extremely cold in the morning. So when your alarm goes off at 5 a.m. in the morning, you're wrapped up in your nice blanket, you're extremely warm. And you don't want to get up because you know as soon as you take that blanket off, that cold air is going to hit your skin and it's, it's going to cause you to shiver. Right? So, Shaitan is in your ear whispering, you know what, you still have time, hit the snooze button, you don't have to wake up right now. Your nafs is telling you you're too warm, you don't want to feel that cold. Right? So despite all of these things, despite the whisperings of Shaitan, despite your own soul telling you to keep sleeping, you say, you know what, forget it, and you throw off your blanket. So that feeling of cold hitting your body, and you enjoying that, that enjoyment that you feel that now I'm getting up, I'm sacrificing this comfort that I'm feeling just to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the sweetness of Iman. Right? Similarly, maybe you're walking down the street, you're at school, you're at work, and your eyes happen to fall upon something you're not supposed to look at. So shaitan again, he's in your ear. You know what? Go ahead and look. No one's looking at you. No one's going to find out about this. You can keep looking. Your nafs is telling you, you know what? You're enjoying this. Keep looking. Right? But at that moment, despite those whisperings, Despite your nafs telling you to keep looking, you look away. So you feel this kind of bitterness that, you know what, man, I really wanted to look. But despite that, you look away just to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the sweetness of Iman. So in a hadith narrated in both Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us, ثَلَاثٌ مَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ وَجَدَ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ That whoever possesses three characteristics or three traits, has found the sweetness of faith. أَنْ يَكُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا That Allah and His Messenger وسلم, are more beloved to Him than anything else in this world. وَأَنْ يُحِبَّ الْمَرْأَ لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ And He loves a person and He does not love him except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنْ يَكْرَهَ أَنْ يَعُودَ فِي الْكُفْرِ and he dislikes returning to disbelief just as he dislikes being thrown into the hellfire. So when we look towards the hadith, we find that the Prophet ﷺ, he has compared our iman, he has compared our faith to, the, to a tree. Right? So that deep-rooted conviction in our hearts, that firmly, deeply rooted belief in our hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that the Prophet ﷺ was his last and final messenger, are the roots of this tree. Right? Then the verbal expression of this deeply rooted conviction in our hearts, by saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that is the trunk of this tree. Right? Our verbal expression of our faith, it is the trunk of this tree. And then the branches of this tree 
our, all our acts of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our praying, our fasting, our giving zakah, our giving charity, our being kind to our parents, this having this quality of haya or modesty. And upon these branches, of course, there's going to be leaves. And the scholars mention that what these leaves are, are our extra acts of worship, our voluntary acts of worship, extra praying, extra fasting, extra recitation of the Qur'an. And then of course upon these leaves there are fruits. And the sweetness of these fruits, they are only tasted by those people who enjoy obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has told us about three characteristics, three qualities, that if we bring these three qualities into our life, then we can as well taste the sweetness of Iman. That we ourselves, we will enjoy worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will enjoy following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa praying five times a day, it won't seem as a burden. Burden. It won't seem like something difficult. Right? So the first thing that he mentioned was, أَن يَكُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا That Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to Him than anything else in this world. Now sometimes this concept of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, it can be something difficult to understand. How can we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can we love Him more than we love our parents? How can we love Allah more than we love our children? How can we love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa more than we love our parents when we never met him? Right, so it's important to understand that love is actually of two types. There are two types of love. The first is a natural love. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in the hearts of each and every single human being. Right, the love a mother feels for her child. The, the love a child feels for, her parent, for, his, for his or her parents. That is something natural that Allah puts in all of our hearts. And there's a second type of love, which is an acquired love. It's something that we gain. Right? It's something that we can acquire by reading about the greatness of somebody. So this is the type of love that we're going to have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa That when we think about the greatness of Allah, our hearts will slowly, slowly get closer to Allah. When we think about the greatest example of the, uh, in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when we read about his life, we'll start getting closer and closer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So a question should be popping into our minds is, how can we increase our love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can we build this connection with Allah so that He is more beloved to us than anything else in this world? So that obeying His commandments becomes easy. Staying away from His prohibitions becomes something easy. It's not something burdensome. So some of our pious scholars of the past they mention four things that we can do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is that we have to remain constant and steadfast in fulfilling our obligations to Allah. We have to remain constant and steadfast in fulfilling our obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Praying five times a day, fasting the month of Ramadan, giving zakah, doing hajj once in your lifetime if you're able to do so. All of these acts of worship are of extreme importance. These are the ways that we can initially get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially praying. Right? There's no way that the importance of prayer can be overemphasized. That is the first thing that we're going to be asked about on the day of judgment. It's, it's that one thing that distinguishes a believer from a non-believer. Is salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask much from him regarding salah. All he asks from us is to turn to him five times a day. Right? And praying these five times a day does not take a lot of effort, nor does it take a lot of time. It's something that is simple. But unfortunately, a lot of us, we might see it as something burdensome. Right? It becomes an obstruction in our daily lives, in our daily schedule. But it should not be so. These five daily salawat should be something that we enjoy doing. That we enjoy taking time out of our day to turn back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can worship Him and show gratitude for all of the blessings He has given us. Again, these acts of worship, these, these obligatory acts of worship are actually the best way that we can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself says in a hadith Qudsi, مَقْتَرَبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That my servant or my slave has not come nearer to me with anything more beloved to me than those things that I have made obligatory upon him. 
So in this hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is telling us that the best way to get closer to Allah, the best way to establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by performing our obligations. The second thing the scholars mention is that we have to read the Qur'an and reflect over its meanings. All of us know that the Qur'an is the final word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent it as a guidance for all of mankind and as a guidance especially for the people who have God consciousness. So the Qur'an, it's a book of guidance. And the only way that we can get guidance from the Qur'an is not only if we read it, but we read it along with its meanings. That when we read the Qur'an, we should sit and we should reflect and we should ponder over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. What is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us in our daily lives? What guidance is He giving on how to live our daily lives? And if we read His words, that automatically brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we learn about the lessons and morals and the guidance that He has in this book for us, obviously these will also get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing that the scholars mention is that we have to reflect and ponder over the greatness of Allah. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord and sustainer. He is the one that created us. He is the one that has given us life. He is the one that's going to give us death. He is the one that's going to bring us back to life again. He is the one that feeds us, clothes us, gives us drink. He is the Lord and master of every single thing in the universe. And not only is He the Lord and Master and Sustainer of every single thing in the universe, but He is also aware of every single thing that we do. What we say, what we speak, what we hide in our hearts, what things we steal with our eyes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all of these things. And on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has blessed us with so many blessings. Right? He has blessed us with innumerable blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly showering us with His blessings and mercies. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا That if you try to count the blessings and favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to do so. So we should constantly be reflecting and thinking over these blessings of Allah. And if you do so, of course, you will get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last thing that they mention is that we should increase our voluntary acts of worship. That in our daily lives, we should look and see that wherever we have time or whenever we have the opportunity, we should try to pray a little bit more. Maybe just two rakahs extra a day, right? After the sun rises maybe, or after Salatul Maghrib. We should try to pray a little bit extra. Maybe fast one extra day in the month. During the month, pick a day, pick a Monday or a Thursday, and fast that day. And if we do these extra voluntary acts of worship, then slowly, slowly we'll get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, the second aspect of this part of the hadith is that we're supposed to love the Prophet ﷺ more than we love anything else in this world. And this is actually a sign of our faith. It's a sign of our iman. The Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. That none of you truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his father, his son, and all of mankind. So this love for the Prophet ﷺ, it's something that is mandatory for us to be complete believers. To be complete mu'mins, to be true believers, it is necessary for us to have love for the Prophet ﷺ. We have to love him more than our own parents. And again, how can we acquire this love of the Prophet ﷺ? The best way to do so is to read about his life. Read about his seerah. Read about how he was born as an orphan. Read about how he was raised, how revelation came to him. Read about the persecution and the, and the troubles and difficulties he went in spreading the message throughout Mecca. Read about his migration to Medina. Then read about his life in Medina and how he was able to establish an Islamic state and spread Islam throughout the whole Arabian Peninsula and eventually throughout the entire world. If we read about his life, we'll also gain an appreciation for the Prophet ﷺ. We'll start finding ourselves being more attached to him. We'll start finding ourselves loving the Prophet ﷺ even more. We should read about his sunnah. We should read his actions and his sayings and his doings. We should read about how he interacted with people, how he dealt with his wives, how he dealt with his children, how he dealt with believers and non-believers. Again, if we read about these things, then obviously we'll automatically have a stronger connection with the Prophet ﷺ. And we should also try our best to act upon his sunnah. 
that whatever sunnah we learn about, whatever little, however small it may be, we should try our best to act upon it. Because when we act upon the sunnah, obviously it shows our love for the Prophet ﷺ. No matter how small or insignificant it may seem. So this is the first trait or the first characteristic. Is that we are supposed to love Allah and His Messenger ﷺ more than anything else in this world. The second thing he mentioned was, وَأَن يُحِبَّ الْمَرْءَ لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ that he loves a person and he doesn't love him except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this portion of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's drawing our attention to this concept of brotherhood and unity in Islam. That all of us are Muslims, we are one ummah. We are all brothers and sisters of one another, right? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa. That the true believers are brothers. And that bond that ties us is not the bond of nationalism. Right? It doesn't matter if you're Pakistani, you're Arab, you're Egyptian, you're Syrian. It, does, it doesn't matter what race or what color you are. It doesn't matter what language you speak. The bond that ties us together is the bond of Iman. Right? This strong bond of faith that each and every single one of us sitting in this masjid today, all of us are brothers to one another. Simply because we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this bond is something that is supposed to transcend all these differences that we have. Right? No matter what language we speak or where we're from, what country we're from, what nationality we have, this bond of Iman, it transcends all of these things. It overtakes all of these things. And simply because of that, we have concern and care for one another. That although all of us might not even know each other, but regardless of that, we still have a connection with one another. We still care for one another. If someone is in need, we help them. We're kind to them. We, we, we speak to them in a good manner. And this is the example of how all Muslims should be. Right? The Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith, الْمُؤْمِنُونَ كَرَجُلٍ وَاحِدٍ or الْمُؤْمِنُونَ كَجَسِدٍ وَاحِدٍ That the believers are like one body. The believers, the entire ummah, it's like one body. If the eye hurts, then the entire body hurts. So similarly, we as Muslims, if one person is hurting, if one person is in pain, they're in some type of trouble, all of us should feel that pain and struggle. Right? If our brothers and sisters in Somalia, Afghanistan, in Palestine, Iraq, wherever it may be, wherever they're feeling pain and struggling, we should also feel that pain and struggle. We should help and make dua for them at least. Right? If the head of that body hurts, then the entire body feels that pain. That is how we're supposed to be as one ummah. This, this, this uh, concept of brotherhood and unity. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ, he's drawing our attention to this. And the only way to build this strong bond of unity and, and oneness and togetherness of one ummah is that we love each other solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no other reason behind me having concern for you or you except that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third characteristic or the third trait that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that if we bring this into our lives then we too can also taste the sweetness of iman is that we safeguard our iman. That we dislike returning to disbelief just as we dislike being thrown into the hellfire. Now alhamdulillah, probably the majority of people sitting in this room were born Muslim. Right? The majority of sitting in this room, we were born Muslim. So we don't truly recognize how great of a ni'mah, how great of a blessing this deen of Islam is. This deen of Islam is the, the biggest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, is the deen of Islam. Just ask anybody who has come from disbelief to disbelief. Right, who has come from ignorance into light and knowledge and, and guidance. This is a huge gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's giving us this advice that you have to safeguard this iman. That this iman, it's a gift from Allah. And it's a precious gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to do your best effort to actually safeguard it. And all of us know that the society we live in today, it's not the ideal Islamic environment. Right? All of us know that where we are living today, we're at school, we're at university, we're at work, it's not the ideal Islamic environment. Our society is filled with concepts of disbelief. Right? It's filled with materialism and consumerism. It's filled with this culture of like, the celebrity culture. Everyone likes celebrities. It's filled with this pop culture. 
It's filled with all of this junk. And all of these things, a lot of the ideas espoused by these ideologies, they're diametrically opposed to Islam. And when we're submerged in this society, it has an effect on our iman. Whether we admit it or not, it has an effect on our iman. Right? When you walk outside the masjid, you probably feel a little bit lower than you were when you were inside the masjid. So it does have an effect on us. The environment we're in plays a huge role in defining us and how we behave and, how, and what we believe in. That is why it is necessary for us to safeguard our iman. And the best place to safeguard our iman is to bring ourselves into an Islamic environment. It's to bring ourselves to the masjid, to the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If we bring ourselves to the masjid daily, inshallah we'll be putting ourselves in an environment that will help us safeguard our iman in our daily lives. So these are the three things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned. That if we bring these three characteristics, if we bring these three traits into our lives, then we too can taste the sweetness of iman. We will enjoy worshipping Allah. We will enjoy following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all from amongst those people who taste the sweetness of iman in this world inshaAllah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا فإنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد If all the brothers can please move forward to make room for the brothers in the back uh, Fill in the empty spaces, there's still a lot of empty spaces So just fill them in so there's room for the brothers to come in Alhamdulillah, just a short recap That if we want to taste the sweetness of Iman If we want to be obedient servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that we don't find the obligations as a burden, that we find His obligations as something that we enjoy doing, we find pleasure in fulfilling them, we find pleasure in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we should try to bring these three characteristics into our lives. We should make an effort to build a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should make an effort to practice upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should make an effort to, you know, find out about our, our brothers and spread peace amongst our brothers. We should try to find out, we should try to meet one another and build our communities and have a sense of a community. We should love each other simply for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, we should make an effort to safeguard our iman. If we do these three things, then inshallah, we will taste the sweetness of iman. Right? We will be like that companion who was able to continue his prayer after being shot by four arrows. That that pain was nothing compared to the enjoyment he was having in his prayer and his recitation. So again, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those people who actually taste the sweetness in this life, inshaAllah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِيهِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون أقم الصلاح